they play. Yeah, I always enjoy it, but I have a question for you this morning uh, to start off with. What does Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38, what phrase do they all have in common? I'll give you a hint. 117 was uh, Martin Luther's uh, life verse. That helped, didn't it? No. <laughs> Here it is. The just shall live by faith. Now we've all heard that. We all know that. But I bet you didn't know it was sprinkled through the Bible uh, like that. The just shall live by faith. Well, it kind of begs the question, though. Who are the just? The just are all those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The moment we accept him as our Savior, we are justified in the eyes of God. Not because we are righteous, but because Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. That's what Luther figured out. Uh, because Luther couldn't understand how he could ever, as a human being, be justified in the eyes of God. How could he do enough to be justified in the eyes of God? Well, he could not. And it finally came to him that justification is imputed to us by Jesus Christ. So the just shall live by faith. Now, we kind of like that, but there's a problem with that. And again, if we, if we look in Hebrews, in chapter 11, verse 1, we see that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen. Well, now that muddies the waters a bit, doesn't it? Because faith is it's a nebulous thing. It, it, we, we can't quantify it. We can't touch it. We, we can't see it. Uh, we can't corral it. And, and so it's, it's hard sometimes to live by faith. But then you go down uh, to, to Hebrews 11.6 and it says that without faith it is impossible to please God. Well, why would that be? Because without faith, we'll never step out and do the things God has for us to do. You remember in, in, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, By grace we save through faith, not of ourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10, we were created to do good works which he had planned beforehand for us. Then the, the problem is, if we don't have enough faith in Him to believe He's going to lead us and empower us to do these things, we won't do them. And so to please God, we have to have faith. Well, as we walk through the first four chapters of the book of Esther, we've seen, if it's one thing, that our hero, Mordecai, and our heroine, Esther, did not have... It's faith. Remember, they've done everything they could so far to cover up the fact that they're God's people. They were Jews. They're in Persia. They're captives. And they didn't want anybody to know. They wanted to fit in. They wanted to get along. They, they had no faith. But then we saw, in chapter 4, there was a crisis, wasn't there? In that, uh, our evil villain... Haman had convinced the, the malleable king to make this law that on a certain day, all the Jews were to be killed. Well, that sort of put them in a crisis situation, didn't it? Because they're both Jews. What are they going to do? And by the way, what we're talking about faith... Those of you that have been with us on this journey know that uh, we haven't seen any evidence of God working, have we? We, we? We've not seen anything. Now, we may look back and say, yeah, I can see. But if we were there, if we were on the spot, we can't see it. Just like in our lives. When we look at our lives and we look at what's happening now, oftentimes we see no evidence of God. We see, in fact, oftentimes we end up in that place where we say, well, where is God anyway? Why is he allowing me to go through this? If God loves me, if God's all-powerful, how come this is happening to me? 
Boy, you ask that all the time as a pastor. Really, if you're honest, you know, we, we like to have you guys think we're some kind of super Christians, but we're not. We're no better than you are when it comes to faith and those sorts of things. And, and you, you see things happen and you just say, well, how come you let that happen, God? We're doing the best we can here. Everybody's trying. And then you let this happen. But when we get past the crisis and we turn around and we look back, then we can oftentimes say, oh, yeah. Yeah, now I see. Yeah, God was there all along. As Christians, we live our lives by faith. And sometimes that's just a tough thing to do. But I, I, I like it. Patrick Morley uh, has a book out, How God Makes Men. And it's one we're going through in our men's group. And he has a great quote in there. And he says this. He said, God is never more near than when he seems far away. That's true, if you think about it. It's very true. When we think he's doing nothing, when we think he's off on vacation somewhere, leaving us to fend for ourselves, he's right there with us, shepherding us along, making sure that everything is going to work together for our good. In the first four chapters, we followed the very unremarkable life of Mordecai and the very remarkable life of Esther. Now, Mordecai, why do I say his life was unremarkable? Well, if you followed along, uh, he was simply uh, some sort of a mid-level bureaucrat uh, getting along in life. Uh, we, we sort of defined him as the man that leads the uh, life of quiet desperation. He's, he's hidden the fact that he's a Jew and he just fits in and he goes along. We say Esther's life was remarkable. Now she hid the fact that she was a Jew also, but you know, she was the one that was picked to, to, to go uh, audition, so to speak, for the, for, to be the queen, and she was picked to be queen. And uh, her life is going great. But then we saw, last week, all of a sudden the fact that she is Jewish comes out. Now the king doesn't know that yet, but those immediately around her do. And that's going to have a profound effect. So while Mordecai has sort of gone along to get along, Esther has lived sort of a charmed life up till this time. She's the queen of the Persian Empire, the most powerful empire on earth at the time. She's in a pretty good position. When this changed, when they were forced to admit to the fact that they were God's people, a couple of things happened. All of a sudden, they began to act in faith. They did sort of an about face from the way they were living previously. You remember we said that all of a sudden, Mordecai has the faith of an Abraham. Because in verse 14 of chapter 4, probably the most well-known verse out of the book of Esther, where he goes to Esther and he says that perhaps God has brought you here for just such a time as this. But he also tells her, if you look there in 4.14, that he says, If you do not act, know that God will bring deliverance for his people from somewhere else. In other words, he's saying, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know that God is going to take care of his people, ultimately. And then, we noted that Esther, all of a sudden, has the face of a, the face of a Daniel. And she stands up and she says, okay, I'll go to the king. But you remember, you didn't go to the king of your own volition, in jeopardy of death. But she says, I'll go anyway. And in verse 15, she says, and if I perish, I perish. And we, we noted that in the Hebrew grammar, it, that's a, a much more forceful ver verse than, than it is in English. Because in, in English, it comes out like, well, maybe I, the fact that I'm going to perish is one of many outcomes. But in the Hebrew, the fact that I'm going to perish is the most probable outcome. So she's saying, I am going to go to the king and make a plea for my people even though I'll probably lose my head. Now, isn't that the faith of a Daniel? 
me. All of a sudden, our two people who were meek and afraid of their faith, afraid to say that they were God's people, become giants in our eyes. We saw that all of this came to be not by the obvious acts of God, but rather by a series of subtle coincidences. Well, what do you mean, Pastor, not by the acts of God? What I mean is this. We saw no miracles. We saw no big, overt things happen in their lives. We saw a bunch of little coincidences. C.S. Lewis says this. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. You see? You see, we say, well, coincidentally, I ran into somebody today who, whatever, and, and I was able to minister to them or share a word with them or whatever. Well, coincidentally, God brought you together. He just didn't put his signature on it. You see, I like that. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Well, let's look and see what we have now in chapter 5. We, we've got this all set up. And uh, we're really going to deal with a couple of people here. Our heroine and our villain. So let's start with, with our heroine Esther, the piece that Bill read for us, the first eight verses of chapter 5. Who knows whether God, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Now that's a chapter 4, I realize. He gives Esther a challenge. Who knows? You don't know, Esther. I don't know. But I think it's a possibility. So Esther is now put in a position that we call where she has a crossing the Rubicon moment. And you probably have those in your life from time to time. And, and if you're not familiar with that phrase, crossing the Rubicon, it, it comes from 49 BC. Julius Caesar is coming back with his legions. He's coming down through northern Italy, heading towards Rome. And there's a little river there, doesn't amount to much, called the Rubicon. But Roman law said this, if any, anyone brings an army across the Rubicon, it is an act of treason, and they'll be at war with Rome. So he comes to the river, he stops, he talks with his generals, they advise him to leave the army there and go on in. He says, no, I'm going to take my legion with me. And he crossed the Rubicon. Well, as soon as he did that, he was at war with Rome. And he was. And if you know, know a little bit about history, you know that he won and became the head of the country. But once he did that, he couldn't turn back. There was no turning back. And so Esther is faced with this situation. Once I commit, once I go before the, to the king, there's no turning back. There's no getting in there and saying, oh, gee, this was a mistake. Never mind, king. Oh, no. To her credit, Esther says, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. You remember now, the law was everything in Persia. And the law said this. No one can approach or come into the king's presence lest they are invited. And if they do, unless the king holds out his scepter to them, they will be executed on the spot. And if you were to be able to peer into the throne room of, Xer of Xerxes, or Ahasuerus as he's called in here, you would have seen that he had several guards around him, and one of those guards had a very conspicuous axe. And the axe was for the purpose of taking off people's heads that dared enter his presence without an invitation. And again, we've, we've talked enough about these kings and that, and even the ones in the New Testament are the same. You know, their lives were always in jeopardy. There was always somebody trying to kill them. So, of course, they didn't want people just approaching them. So he, he, he had some good reason for that. But she says, I'm going to take the chance. I'm going to do it. She had to choose between trusting the king to save her or God. She had to choose between the seen and the unseen. And that's where we're at a lot of times in our lives. 
We have to choose between the seen and the unseen. Sometimes it looks to us like this is the, the thing to do. This is the rational thing to do. This is the, I've thought this through. It looks like this is, this is the safe play. But God's calling us to take a chance. He's calling us to step out. He, he's calling us to do something that in our power, we have no way to control the situation. It's a Rubicon moment. What are we going to do? Do we cross and risk everything? Or do we stay on this side where it's safe? Esther says, I will cross. She has decided to act. But now, she's decided to act, but how is she going to do it? Is she going to rush into the king's presence and say, Hey, I want you to do this and this and this. I've seen Christians take that approach. You probably have too. It's usually not very effective. You know, you pin somebody up against the wall, hey, you're going to hell unless you accept Jesus. Well, it's true, but it's not very effective. You know? We need to be a little more winsome, a little more thoughtful. And so Esther is. She's very thoughtful. Now, she's already spent time in prayer, right? Remember the end of chapter 4? She spent three days in praying and fasting. And, and Mordecai had organized the, the Jewish community, and they had been praying and fasting for her. So she doesn't need to pray now. She's already done that. So the next thing is to do something. You know, I, I had a, a friend a few years ago, and he used to say that he just hated it when he had ask a Christian to do something and they'd say well I'll pray about it now I'm all for prayer but here's the here's the truth of the matter about half the time and I'm probably being charitable there when a Christian says I'll pray about it it really means I don't want to do it so I'm going to take a couple of days and then I'm going to tell you well God told me not to do it because <laughs> yeah. here's the way I feel about it if there's something that needs to be done in God's kingdom and somebody asks you to do it, that's probably God asking you to step up and do it. You see? Now, not always, but I think the vast majority of the time. So Esther has prayed. Now she steps into action. But look how she does it. Verse 1 and 2, I'll read that for you again. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne beside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight and he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Well, what's important there? Esther shows great humility and deference to the king. She puts on her royal robes. She dresses properly to come into the presence of the king. She doesn't just show up. She dresses properly. And then she doesn't blurt anything out. She, she doesn't do anything improper. She just stands there quietly. King looks at her. And can you imagine what her stomach's doing? Because if he doesn't hold that scepter out, she loses her head. And so she stands there. King looks at her. And we don't know how long it went on. But if it went on for 10 seconds to her, it probably seemed like a week. You know, when you think you're in that kind of a position. And he holds the scepter out. Now she does exactly what decorum would call for. She goes up and she touches the end of the scepter. Just because God has called you to do something, it doesn't mean you can completely disregard all the social trappings that go with life. You know, sometimes you need to go through the proper channels in the proper way. Now, there are times when we need to do otherwise, and we'll see as we go through the book. But Esther, I believe through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, has decided to approach with great reverence and great respect for the king.
So he holds his scepter out to her. She followed, she dressed appropriately, she followed protocol, and now notice she had prepared ahead of time. She didn't just bust in there with hoping God would tell her what to say. She prepared ahead of time. In verse 4, we see, And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared. She had the feast already, just in case the king should accept. That's good planning. See? That's good planning. The king accepts. He says, great. Haman and I will come. Well, she gets them there and, and they're enjoying the feast. Uh, this is the time to pop the question, isn't it? Haman and the king are drinking and eating and they're merry. No. Patience is called for here. So rather than get right to business, she says to the king, if it please the king, I have a request. And the king says back to her, anything, Esther, even up to half of my kingdom. Now that, that was just, that's hyperbole. That's so the way they talked in those days to say, anything you want, I'll give it to you. And so Esther, instead of saying, I want you to save my people, she says, I want you to come to another feast. I'm going to have one to, that I will prepare tomorrow. Just you and Haman. Okay, he says, great. First one was good, second one will probably be better. Yeah, we'll, we'll come. How difficult it is sometimes to hold back, isn't it? To just keep quiet and kind of let the situation play out. But Esther is able to do that. And if you come back next week, you can find out what happens. But here, our attention turns to Haman. And you're all supposed to go, boo, Haman's bad. <laughs> Haman, we find him in verses 9 through 14. Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. He's going home from the feast. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home and sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther let no one but me come to the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I was invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting in the king's gate. Then his wife Zareth and her friends said to him, Let a gallows of fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. Then go joyfully with the king to the feast. The idea pleased Haman. And he had the gallows made. Well, it's working out well for, uh, for uh, Mordecai, isn't it? He exercised his faith. He, he convinced Esther to go. And what's going to happen? They're gonna, he's going to get hung. And isn't that the way it is in our lives a lot of times? We're, we're doing something. We, 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 we decide we need to do it a little more in a more godly fashion. So we, we, we start doing better. And we're, maybe we're reading our Bibles more. We're praying more. We're, we're sharing Jesus with people more. And it gets, our situation gets worse. You've probably been there. And you say, God, what's going on? I'm doing better down here. How can you let my situation get worse? Well, once again, we have to wait for things to play out. But we're going to take a little look at Haman. Haman is the epitome of a man filled with himself. He's prideful. He's arrogant. It's all about him. There's nothing worse than pride. That's why the Bible talks so much about pride and warns us not to be prideful human beings. Verse 9, Haman went out joyful because he had just come from this exclusive dinner. You think about it now. He just had dinner with the most powerful man on earth, 
Ahasuerus, and his wife, the queen. And they ate, and they drank, and they had a great time. And he has been elevated to, you remember the king had given him his signet ring prior to that. He, he was able to give commands. He was, life was good. He had everything going for him. But, there's this one little mid-level bureaucrat that amounts to nothing by the name of Mordecai. And he will not bow to Haman. And it drives Haman nuts. Now, Haman, why does Haman even care? This guy is totally insignificant, and I'm the second most powerful guy in the world. He cares because his pride forces him to care. He can't stand the fact that this one person won't bow down to him. That's the problem with being a prideful person. You can have everything going for you, and one little thing completely upsets your apple cart. It can be from the most significant, insignificant person, and it just eats at you. Haman craved recognition, he craved praise. It's like a drug. You can never get enough once you start down that road. No amount is enough. So now, he must soothe his dented ego. So he goes home, he gets his wife and all his friends around him, and he recounts all of this, the great things he's done, all of the things the king has bestowed upon him, and, and how many kids he has. Now, it's a little silly, isn't it? You get your wife and you tell her how many kids you have. I bet she already knows. <laughs> But that's what we look like when we get on these prideful things, these, hey, look at me things, look what I've done. We, we look silly in the eyes of others. But that's where Haman's at. What he should have done was called some people together that would give him good counsel, that would probably say, hey, Haman, you got it made, just leave Mordecai alone and get on living the good life. But he doesn't want that. And remember, we've talked a lot about this. Weak leaders never surround themselves with counselors that will challenge them, but always with those who will tell them what they want to hear. And so what do these guys tell him? Along with his wife, by the way, she wasn't any help either. they tell him to have Mordecai killed. And a very revealing fact about Haman is in the very last sentence of this chapter. The idea pleased Haman. The idea of killing a perfectly innocent individual to bolster his ego pleased him. You know, sometimes we're guilty of that. Now, we don't have somebody murdered, but sometimes we fail to do the right thing because the wrong thing makes us feel better in the immediate context. It pleases us because we're all a little prideful in one way or another. So we need to be on guard against that. We need to surround ourselves with counselors who will say, wait a minute. Take a look at what you're doing. Take a look at the road you're going down not those who will get along to go along. Haman was perfectly willing to build himself up by destroying another. And you know, when we see this other places in Scripture, one that jumped out at me is the 1 Kings chapter 21. You can read that for yourself sometime. Some of you will know the story. It's the story of another king, King Ahab. A very powerful individual. And he was married to a woman like Zeresh, but her name was Jezebel. Now Ahab has everything in the kingdom that he could possibly want, but he wants one more thing. He wants this vineyard that belongs to a guy named Naboth. And he tries to buy the vineyard, and Naboth says, no, this vineyard's been in my family for years. I don't want to sell it. King says, I want it. No, I'm not going to sell it. King goes home. 
I'm all sad because Naboth won't sell the vineyard to me. Jezebel says, no problem. Kill him. And then you can have the vineyard. Oh, great. So he kills Naboth. Pride. It's what pride does. Why does the Bible talk so much about the destructiveness of pride? I mean, after all, the Hamans and the Ahabs of this world, and there are many, they don't read the Bible. Christians read the Bible, for the most part. So why does he talk so much about pride? Let me tell you another story where pride caused a lot of problems. It's in 2 Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. Another king. This king has everything. He's the king of a powerful nation. His armies are off conquering. And he sees something he wants. And what does he see? Who does he see? Bathsheba. And the king's name is David. I see it. It looks good. I want it. I have the power, I'll take it. Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to murder her husband by proxy. But that's okay, I want it, I see it, I have the power, I'll take it. And he does. The reason the Bible talks so much about pride is that we Christians are just as susceptible to it as the non-Christians. David a man after God's own heart did exactly the same thing as Ahab and Haman would like to do. Well, what do we learn from this? Lessons from chapter 5. Faith versus pride. The two don't go together. You're either living by one or you're falling into the grips of the other. Because faith requires humility, it requires dependence. It requires obedience. Pride, on the other hand, produces arrogance, produces independence, and produces lawlessness. Faith asks, what can I do for God? And by extension, what can I do for others? Pride asks, what can others do for me? I don't remember who said it to give them credit, but someone said that we should love people and use things. But all too often we love things and use people. Second, once again we leave our heroine and our hero in grave jeopardy. Esther, though her plan seems to be working out, still has not revealed her Jewishness to the king, nor asked him to alter his law. An absolutely unprecedented request. She doesn't know the outcome yet. Mordecai, they've built his gallows that they're going to hang him on. 75 feet high. This is going to be a big deal. We don't know We'll have to wait. And isn't that the way it is in our lives? Sometimes we can see the gallows that's been built for us. How is God going to deliver us? When is God going to deliver us? Is God going to deliver us? Now remember the words of Daniel to Nebuchadnezzar? Our God will deliver us from your hands, though he may not deliver us from the furnace. You see, we may be hung on that gallows. But what is the ultimate deliverance for a Christian? You remember the, 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 the quote I, I like, where they're, they're about to hang the man, and he says, for me, this is the end, the beginning of life. Bonhoeffer, by the way. Hitler hung him. And he knew what we need to know. The physical death may be the end of this life, but it's the beginning of the rest of our lives, which will last for eternity. And finally, where is God? 
We've talked about Mordecai. We've talked about Haman. We've talked about Ahasuerus. Uh, we, we've talked about Esther. In the words of this book. But we've never talked about God. He's not been mentioned one time. And yet he's been working. We see him working. Constantly. And again, I'll leave you, I'd like to leave you with Morley's quote. God is never more near than when he seems far away. And so it was 2,100 years ago when Jesus Christ went to the cross. From an onlooker's viewpoint, they would say, where was God? And yet God was right there all the time. Securing for us the salvation that will last for eternity. So we see if we, if we look at the cross in isolation, it looks like a bad thing. And in isolation, it was a bad thing. But if we look at it in the view of God's grand plan, it was a good thing because it secured salvation for us. It imputed the righteousness of Christ to us who will but accept him as our Lord and Savior. So I just say that if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if, if you're wondering where God is, now is the time to cement your relationship with him. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, we're going to pray here in a minute. You just have to ask Him to be your Lord and Savior and it's done. And it's good forever. It's irrevocable. It's guaranteed by His Holy Spirit. And then, as the communion elements come by, join in with us and you'll experience it in a, in a way that you have never experienced it before. As we remember Christ's body and His blood, that were shed for us. Tremendous thing. Lord, thank you for the book of Esther, Lord, and for your not mentioning your name in it because it just really brings home to us the fact that you are near when we think you are far. That your words that you would never leave us nor forsake us are absolutely true. Isaiah says we may go through the fire, but we will not be burned up. We may go through the flood, but we will not drown. We can cling to those words. And your words. In this world we will have tribulation, but we can be of good cheer because you have overcome this world. And so, Lord, as we celebrate your supper, be with us. Help us, Lord, to feel your nearness. And if we don't, to have the faith to know that you are still there. In Jesus' name, amen.